getting near the end of March, do you know what important events or what important event happens now as we transition into April as the weather warms? It's relevant to this course. Come on, you know. Flu is winter disease, not West not Nile. spring and summer. <laughs> uh, West Nile. Why would West Nile come up now? Because that's when all the mosquitoes start coming around. Mosquitoes. Now. Mosquitoes are star. I saw one the other day. The mosquitoes. <laughs> so they live in the subways and underneath leaves through the winter. They overwinter, and if there are any viruses in them, they stay over the winter and they begin to redeliver them in the spring. So now we will find out if, in fact. Zika will spread in the US because now we're going to have the mosquitoes here and the virus is being introduced. So stay tuned. We will know in the course of this course what, what is going to happen. And you will understand it because you've taken this course. And today we're going to take advantage of a lot that you've learned. We're going to talk about mechanisms of pathogenesis. Remember, pathogenesis is the production of disease. So we're going to talk about how viruses make disease. Now, in order to do this, we have to do, we have to make observations in people, of course, and see what happens when they get infected. Not so easy to do, can't manipulate people readily, it's not ethical, so we depend on animal models. It, it is a large goal in virology that we want to understand how viruses cause disease, because if we do, maybe we can prevent it. So we use animal models, and the title of this slide, you should remember for the rest of your lives, my sly and monkeys exaggerate. It's a reflection on the value of animal models. And that's why we have model after the word, animal model. It is a model for disease. It does not mean that whatever we find is exactly duplicated in humans. Many people out there in the rest of the world seem to think so, but it's not true. What you learn in an animal model, you then have to test in people. You cannot assume that what is happening in an animal with a virus also occurs in people. For example, if you make a vaccine against the virus and you test it in an animal model, what's the next step before it goes into people? A clinical trial. You don't go from animals into people because many vaccines and other drugs fail from the animal to the person because animals are not people. We are animals, but we're not the kind that are used for experiments. So remember that. Animals are models for experiments, and we have to validate the findings in people. Not always easy to do, but they give us some leads. We often use mice as animal models. They're convenient, they're easy to breed. You can genetically modify them. You can knock out genes, you can add genes in. Really neat things that you can do with mice. And unfortunately, they're not susceptible to all virus infections. So sometimes we can uh, modulate mice in some way. We can give them human receptors for viruses, for example. Sometimes we can put the whole viral genome in a mouse and mimic a persistent infection. We can put individual genes. Uh, and you can modulate the immune system as well as shown on the bottom. And you can infect these animals and study what happens. Now, what viruses do we use? We'd like to use a human virus in a mouse model, right? That would make most sense because that's a virus we isolate from a sick person and we want to know how it's causing disease, so we put it in an animal. But not all, not all viruses that come out of people will replicate in mice. So we have to sometimes use animal viruses that are close to the human ones, close enough so that we can make inferences, but they will infect mice. Not a perfect situation, but we work with uh, what is available. Now, many years ago, when I came to Columbia to start my lab, it was my goal to make a mouse model to study poliomyelitis. Poliomyelitis is a disease that only affects humans. In nature, it doesn't infect, the virus doesn't infect any other animal but humans. In the lab, you can infect non-human primates, but I didn't want to work with monkeys when I came here, so it was my goal to make an, a mouse model. And we did that in two steps. We identified the cellular receptor for poliovirus. We had, identified its gene, we pulled it out of human cells, and we showed that if you put that gene into mouse cells in culture, those cells can take up virus and replicate it. So mouse cells are already permissive for polio infection. You remember what that means, I hope, but they're not susceptible. If you add the receptor, they become susceptible. And you take this one step further, you take the human gene for the polio receptor, you put it in mice as a transgene, 
the mouse now becomes susceptible and permissive to infection. And you can see this animal has hind limb paralysis. It has polio. We've injected a human strain of polio virus into this animal. It goes to the central nervous system and it causes disease. And we've studied this for many years, many other labs as well, to understand the pathogenesis of polio. And in a really cool twist, all the polio vaccines, the attenuated polio vaccines that are made, are now tested in mice instead of in monkeys. So I have saved thousands of monkeys uh, as a result of this discovery. Isn't that great? I feel good about that. Yes, very good. So you might hear more about this animal model later. Now, one of the things we try and do uh, when we study viral pathogenesis, we study viral virulence, how sick a virus makes you. This is the capacity of a virus to cause disease in a host. And you know, if you see Ebola virus in the news, you know that's very virulent because it's killing people. And then other viruses, maybe rhinoviruses, are not so virulent. You get a common cold out of that. So that's the spectrum of virulence, actually from no disease all the way to lethality. And a virulent virus is one that causes disease. An avirulent or attenuated virus, those are the two terms I will use for viruses that cause less disease or no disease at all. Now, if we want to study virulence in animals, we have to be able to quantitate it. We have to put numbers on it so we can compare results. And there are many ways you can do that. Just a few examples here. The mean time to death if the virus causes death. Uh, the mean time to appearance of symptoms, whatever the symptoms may be in your animal model. Fever, weight loss can be measured. Or you can measure pathological lesions in polio. In our polio-infected mice, we can do sections of the spinal cord and brain and look at the destruction of neurons by the virus. For HIV, that virus it specifically kills and eliminates CD4 positive T lymphocytes. So you can simply take blood and measure the number of CD4 positive cells in the blood. And you can see with HIV infection, the numbers go down. So virulence can be quantified. Here are two examples of quantifying or measuring viral virulence. On the left, we have an experiment where we're infecting mice with two different types of polio virus. And the y-axis is number of survivors versus the day after infection. So this is a very straightforward survival curve. And you can see type 1 polio virus in blue. The mice survive the entire course of the experiment. There's no disease apparent in these animals, whereas the type 2 virus, by, by 10 or 11 days after infection, they're all dead. And what's not shown on here is they also become paralyzed, but our endpoint is death. And so you can see a very, uh, different, a very great difference. And you could quantify uh, how much virus would cause death in 50% of the survivors, and that would give you a way of measuring uh, the outcome. On the right is a different way to measure virulence. Here we are looking at we're giving viruses a neurovirulence score. We're injecting them into the CNS. And then we make sections at a certain time after infection. We look at them under a microscope. And a trained pathologist can score the amount of damage to the cells caused by the virus. So here we have five different uh, viruses. Uh, these are all flaviviruses, like Zika, uh, Japanese encephalitis, yellow fever, et cetera. And what we're looking at is a neurovirulence score. That's, again, a pathologist has looked at the sections and said there's a damage of one, two, three, or four, or something like that. Uh, and it's plotted versus the region of the CNS, cerebellum, brainstem, and spinal cord. And you can see Japanese encephalitis virus has a very high neurovirulence score, whereas dengue virus has quite a low neurovirulence score. And, and the other viruses have an intermediate level. Uh, so again, these are put right into the CNS, so they give you a measure of the neurovirulence of this virus. The virulence of the virus for neural cells is the ability to specifically kill neural cells. Now, this property that I've been talking about, virulence, is relative. It is influenced by many parameters. The dose, obviously, of virus that you put in, the route of infection, if you put virus directly into the brain versus peripherally, that's going to make a difference. Uh, the species that you're using, the age, the gender, susceptibility of the species, and many other parameters as well. The bottom line is, please do not ever compare the virulence of two different viruses. Do not tell me that Ebola virus is more lethal than rhinovirus. 
because you can't make the comparison, even though you may say, oh, look at all the people who die of Ebola virus infection. You, you can't compare because they are different people, they're different populations, it's a different virus, there are different amounts of virus administered different ways. And in fact, you cannot compare those two because you could never do an experiment in a similar way with both viruses. So you can't compare the virulence. We can compare virulence within, say, flaviviruses. They're all viruses of the same family. If we inoculate the same amount of virus into the same host by the same route and maintain those hosts under, hosts under similar conditions, then we can compare, as I did in the previous slide, and I said one flavivirus was more neurovirulent than the others, but never across different families of viruses. And here's an example of how the route of inoculation makes a big difference on virulence measurements. This is a virus called lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus. It's, it is a rodent virus that has been used in laboratory studies. It typically does not infect people. However, there have been some human infections. This is a virus that you will often find in your pet hamster. And normally, uh, you will not show any consequences of infection. In fact, if any of you have a hamster, you're probably seropositive for this virus. But if you happen to be immunosuppressed, let's say you go for an organ transplant, and then you come home and you're on immunosuppressive drugs so you won't reject the organ, and you have your little hamster there, there have been some cases of people who got serious infections with this virus because of immunosuppression. Anyway, uh, in, in mice, this has different outcomes depending on the route of inoculation. So we can put 100,000 PFU of this virus intraperitoneally. There's no O in there, I'm sorry. It should be intraperitoneally. And the mice all live. So apparently it can't get to the place where it needs to go to replicate if you put it IP, which is putting a needle right in the belly of the mouse. The mice all survive. But if you put one PFU right in the brain, all the mice die. So this virus has to get to the brain to cause lethality. Its virulence is expressed in the brain. And if you put it IP, it can't get there. It's not very neuroinvasive. So again, unless you tell me the exact roots of inoculation, you can't compare virulence even among a single virus like this. First question, which statement about viral virulence is wrong? It can be influenced by dose, root of infection, species, age, gender, susceptibility, can be quantitated by measurement of fever. Ebola virus is more virulent than human papillomavirus. It is the capacity of a virus to cause disease in a host. When comparing virulence, the assays may be the same, which is wrong. So most of you got the right answer, which is C, of course. You cannot ever compare the virulence of two different viruses. So you can't compare Ebola with, rhinovirus, with papillomaviruses or rhinoviruses. You could compare different kinds of Ebola viruses. There are five different kinds, and they vary in their virulence. But that's only because we can compare the same virus. So please remember that. You cannot compare the virulence of different viruses. So in virology, one of the major goals of studying viruses is to understand the viral genes and the host genes that determine virulence, because it's not just the virus that's causing virulence or destruction of tissues or symptoms, it's the host response as well. Now, for many years we could only do this on the virus side because we could make mutations in viral genomes and then ask, are these mutant viruses unable to cause disease in an animal? And then what's the gene and how does it work? Really interesting stuff. Now we can do it in the host as well. For a long time we've been able to knock out uh, genes in, in mice, for example, in cells and culture and various other animals. So we can now uh, look at both sides. So here's an experiment where we're identifying viral virulence genes. We take a virus, a wild type virus. It grows well in cell culture. It makes lots of nice plaques. You put it right in the brain of a mouse. The virus replicates, destroys neural cells. It's neurovirulent. We get paralysis or death. So that's the baseline that we're looking at. Now we want to know what viral genes are causing this phenotype. So we make mutations uh, in the viral genome. In the old days, we used to make these randomly with chemicals and UV light. But nowadays, we can say, I'm interested in this gene, and we can make lots of mutations in it specifically and test them in animals. So here we have a virus with a mutation in a specific gene. It makes the virus grow poorly. It doesn't make many, you see, not many plaques. So the titer is low. When you put it in the brain of an animal, 
It doesn't grow well, and the virus doesn't cause disease. I, I tell you, this is not really interesting, because all you've done is made the virus unable to reproduce, both in cells and in animals. This tells, not, it tells you nothing about the specific requirements in an animal. What we want are genes that have no effect in cell culture, but are specifically needed for making disease in an animal. And that's what we see on the bottom. Here we have a virus with a mutation in a gene. It doesn't affect replication in cell culture, but when you put it in the mouse, it is attenuated. Okay, important concept. Not interested in a general, making a general defect in replication. We want genes that are needed specifically for the animal, all right? And, and there are plenty of genes that are like this, that are not needed in cell culture, but they're needed when the virus is replicating in an animal. And if you're thinking immune antagonism genes, you're on the right track, because in cell culture, there's not much of a, there's no adaptive immune response, of course, so any genes that are needed to antagonize that uh, wouldn't be needed in cell culture. So the result of doing these kinds of experiments for many, many years is that we have viral virulence genes in a number of classes. There are genes that, of course, affect virus replication. If they're affecting it in the cell culture and in the animal, they're not too interesting, but we do have some that specifically affect replication in the host. We have genes involved in invasiveness, the ability to go from one place in the animal or the host to another and invade tissues. We have genes that control tropism, uh, the ability of a virus to infect certain tissues. We have genes, genes that modify host defenses, and these are the antagonism genes that I keep harping on and talking about over and over, innate, intrinsic, and adaptive antagonism genes. You can change those. It doesn't affect replication in cell culture, but it does in an animal. There are genes that enable virus to spread in the host, and there are genes that have intrinsic cell killing effects that are operative in an animal, but not uh, in a cell culture. So let's look at some examples of uh, virulence determinants. One that I particularly like is in the genome of poliovirus, and it doesn't occur in a coding region. It's in a non-coding region of the genome. So here on the bottom is the genome of poliovirus, which is a plus strand RNA, about 7,500 bases long. And you know, it, you remember it encodes a very long polyprotein for most of the RNA, but at the five prime end, there is a non-coding region of about 740 bases. There's no protein encoded in that region. It's non-coding. And remember, it's highly structured. The RNA forms stem loops, and that's where the iris is located that allows ribosomes to bind internally. There are uh, vaccines of polio, which we'll talk about later, called the Sabin vaccines or the oral poliovirus vaccines. These are vaccines that are being used in much of the world now to eradicate polio. You take them by mouth. You just drink the virus, goes into your intestine, replicates, you shed virus, you make a nice immune response, and you're protected. The virus doesn't get into your CNS and it doesn't cause disease. These vaccines have three very important mutations in them. There are three serotypes of polio vaccines and poliovirus, and each uh, serotype of the vaccine has a mutation in a very specific part of this structured non-coding region in this stem loop 5, and that's expanded here on the right, and the wild type sequence is in black. The, the bases that are changed in the type 1, the type 2, and the type 3 vaccine are shown in red. So each of these vaccine strains has a single mutation in this non-coding region that makes them unable to cause polio when you take the vaccine. It's really quite remarkable. These were made long before we were able to sequence genomes and even understand uh, what was going on. So that's an example of a non-coding virulence gene. Now, here's a, an experiment that shows you the remarkable effect of this single non-coding mutation. This is a uh, lethality curve, a survival curve of mice infected with polioviruses, much like the one I showed you before, except these two polioviruses uh, 7, 3, and 8, 4. They're exactly the same except for one base in the 5' prime non-coding region at 7, 472, which is one of the bases where it's important for the attenuation of the vaccines I've just showed you. So one virus has a U at that position, the other virus has a C. If you ino inoculate mice and determine the amount of virus to paralyze 50% of the mice, and that's a common way of expressing virulence, how much you need to kill half the animals, to paralyze half the animals, to cause fever in half the animals. It's mathematically a good way to do that. This virus with a C is quite lethal. 9,000 PFU will wipe out half the animals. But the other virus with a U 
you never get any paralysis or death no matter how much virus you inoculate. One base change does this, and it's in a non-coding region. That one base change also blocks replication in the mouse brain. On the bottom is a graph of virus titer per gram of brain. So you infect mice, you incubate, and at different days post-infection, you sacrifice a few mice, you take out the brain, and you do a plaque assay to see how much virus is present. You can see the virus with a C grows very well. It's in red, grows up to six logs per gram. The virus with a U is cleared, doesn't replicate. So the virus can't replicate, it can't cause lethality or paralysis because of this single mutation uh, in the five prime non-coding region. Some other um, determinants, which are protein coding, not non-coding as I've just told you, are gene products that modify host defenses, which I've been talking about quite a bit, which we'll deal with for a few more lectures. Immune modulators, we've mentioned some that counter apoptosis and some of the intrinsic proteins like ApoBec 3G that counters, uh, that's countered by a viral protein. Uh, there are also what we call virokines and viroceptors. Now remember, when we talked about immune responses, we talked a lot about when, when cells sense the presence of a virus, they produce chemokines and cytokines, and these are the proteins of action of the immune response. They, in turn, bind to receptors. They recruit cells into the infected area. They do many other things. They help cells mature and so forth. Viruses make mimics of those. So the virokines are mimics of the cytokines. They bind the cytokine receptor on the cell, but they don't send a signal into the cell. So they're blocking all the receptors for cytokines, so the cytokines we are making are not able to, to do their thing any longer. In the same way, virus genomes can encode viroceptors. These are soluble receptors for cytokines. So remember, our cells are making cytokines in response to infection. The virus makes a viroceptor which will bind the cytokines and prevent them from binding their receptors on the host cell. The key here is that cytokines and chemokines work by binding receptors, and virus can mimic, virus proteins can mimic both aspects uh, of that process. There are also viral proteins that bind complement and prevent it from acting. Remember, complement is a set of serum proteins that are involved in killing virus-infected cells. Uh, as we've mentioned, there are viral proteins that modify the MHC1 and the MHC2 pathway to prevent antigen presentation on the surface of the cell. And as I said earlier, most of these are not needed for growth in culture because cells in culture don't need to have any of these mechanisms to, they don't have any mechanisms to uh, eliminate virus which, which are based on these processes. So you can delete these genes, they have no effect on growth in culture, yet a major effect in an animal, they make the, the virus attenuated or avirulent. So here's an example of a viral virulence gene in a herpes virus. This happens to be uh, gamma herpes virus 68. It is a herpes virus of mice, so it's a very, it's an example of how we use a herpes virus similar to a human herpes virus, but here's one from mice that infects mice and we can learn about human disease from it. In a normal situation, the wild type virus, you infect mice, uh, it's lethal. Uh, and so in this experiment here, we're measuring survival and the wild type virus you can see is in blue and we're putting increasing amounts of virus on the x-axis. We're looking at percent survival and you can see 50% survival uh, at around 8 PFU or so. So 8 PFU will kill half the mice. If you take out a specific gene called M3, M3 encodes a chemokine receptor. It's a viral protein that encodes a receptor, which in the previous slide uh, I called a uh, virokine receptor, viroceptor. It's a receptor for a chemokine. We delete the gene encoding that receptor it's a soluble receptor which will bind up chemokines and antagonize them. And now look at the virulence of that virus in mice. It is now uh, much more attenuated and the 50% survival dose is well over uh, 100 PFU compared to about 8 for the wild type virus. So here's a gene not required for replication in cell culture. You take it out, virus grows fine in cell culture in mice, the virus can't kill the mice as effectively. The last so that's delta M3. That means we've taken out the gene for M3. When you work with these big DNA viruses, they have big genomes. Whenever you take out a gene, you never know if you're not making accidentally a change somewhere else because the genomes are so big, it's easy for things to happen. So you always put the gene back and make sure that you restore the phenotype. So that's what we've done in the red dots. 
this is the de deletion, and we've replaced the gene into that same spot, and now we have wild type killing again, the red, the red line. It just shows you that there aren't any other mutations that could be fooling you and giving you uh, the wrong phenotype. Uh, very, few pro very few viruses encode what we call toxic viral proteins. In the bacterial world, many bacteria make proteins that are toxins and that damage the host cell and are responsible for a lot of the pathogenesis of bacterial infections. There are very few of these in the virus world, but here's one of them. Uh, it is a non-structural protein of rotaviruses. These are uh, rheoviruses with segmented, double-stranded RNA genomes that cause gastroenteritis in people. They're very important causes of gastroenteritis. We'll talk about them later. They encode a protein called NSP4, which is an enterotoxin. If you just take this protein, you can produce the protein in cells and purify it. If you feed it to experimental animals, they will get gastroenteritis, very much like caused by the virus infection in people. So a single protein seems to be responsible for this disease. And what we think happens is that the NSP4 protein does two things in cells. It blocks a transporter, a sodium glucose transporter uh, in the cell, uh, and it also stimulates an enzyme that causes increases in calcium levels. And between these two, we think this causes exit of fluid from the cell, and that causes the diarrhea. So one of the symptoms of a rotavirus infection, gastroenteritis, one component of that is diarrhea, and we think that it's because the NSVP, NS, NSP4 protein is inhibiting pathways that are important for keeping water uh, in the cell. Now there is another nice example of a cellular virulence determinant. Here, the cellular determinant is an RNA, a microRNA, and it's required by a virus for the virus to cause disease. And this is hepatitis C virus, uh, which is an RNA-containing plus-strand virus we haven't talked about very much, but causes uh, a lot of hepatitis globally, very serious infection, and as a consequence, many companies have been developing antivirals and vaccines to try and prevent infection because long-term infection with this virus can lead to, li lead to liver cancer. So one of the targets of the antivirals is this microRNA called MIR-122. This is a liver-specific microRNA. Remember, microRNAs are made in cells from longer precursors. They're chopped up by enzymes into 22 nucleotide RNAs, and then those RNAs typically bind a message and silence it. In this case, the microRNA, MIR-122, is actually needed for the replication of hep C, and it's one of the reasons why the virus doesn't grow in non- -hepato hepatic tissues, non-liver tissues, because those tissues don't have MIR-122. And the way we think MIR-122 works, there is, just like in the coronavirus genomes, there's a five prime non-coding region in the viral RNA, and just the five prime UTR is shown at the top here, um, and it's highly structured, and MIR-122 binds to the five prime non-coding region and somehow stabilizes it and is needed for replication. So what's been designed is a drug called Miravirsin, which is a complement of MIR-122. It's a chemically synthesized RNA, which is protected so it won't be degraded in cells. And what it does is binds to MIR-122. So now MIR-122 can't bind to the viral genome. So this is, a, this is an RNA drug, essentially. And this has been tested in phase one and phase two trials in people. And it's very, very effective at reducing viral loads in people. So it's likely that in the next few years, it'll be licensed along with many other anti-hep C drugs. So really cool idea where, and this is why we study viral virulence. We wanna know what's needed for it so that we can possibly uh, antagonize it. Now much of the um, virulence of viruses has two components, this, the virus and the host. So the virus part is virus killing cells. And viruses kill cells in many ways. And you can imagine if a virus is killing liver cells, you're gonna have hepatitis. If it's killing uh, CNS cells, you're gonna have neural disease and so forth. Um, and the other half, of course, is the host response, which we'll get to in a moment. But there are many ways that viruses kill cells. You know, they can be cytopathic. In cell culture, we see as they replicate, they kill the cells by various means like apoptosis, necrosis, and pyroptosis. Many viruses make proteins which punch holes in cell membranes called viroporins and the contents leak out and that's why the cells die. Many viruses inhibit 
host protein in RNA synthesis because they want to commandeer the entire synthetic apparatus for making more viruses. And of course, this leads to uh, cells dying as well. And as you may remember, a long time ago, we talked about how envelope viruses make syncytia. They cause fusion of neighboring cells. So you get a giant cell with many nuclei in it, and this leads to cell killing as well. So viruses have many ways in which to kill cells. Now in our discussion, uh, we're going to next focus on the immune response to infection. But before we get there, I want to just tell you about a really cool discovery made not too long ago, which tells us that the microbiome is also important for viral virulence. And this is something that's largely ignored in terms of interacting uh, with us. So we know the microbiome in us, all the bacteria in us, in our guts, in our, on our skin, and so forth. It's important. And uh, alterations of the microbiome are most likely important for many diseases. But what's underappreciated is that um, viruses, of course, have evolved with us for many years, and they've evolved with our microbiome. So here's a great example, poliovirus, which is a virus that you ingest that replicates in your gut. And of course, in your gut, tons of bacteria. And it turns out that polio requires the gut microbiome in order to multiply. If you take it away, the virus can't replicate. And this is an experiment that shows that. Here, what they've done is taken mice and they feed them polio, and, and the virus uh, replicates in them. So here, for example, on the right, we're looking at viral replication. In untreated mice, you can see the virus is replicating by 24 hours post-inoculation. And uh, this is the percent replication based on a measurement. Now, if you take these mice and you treat them with antibiotics first to reduce their uh, microbiome in their gut, and that's shown here. This is colony forming units per milligram of feces, how many bacteria there are per milligram of feces. This is untreated mice. And these are antibiotic treated mice. So antibiotic treatment knocks down the gut microbiome substantially. Those mice, when you infect with polio virus, the virus can't replicate. The virus depends on a component of bacteria that are present in your gut in order to replicate. Isn't this remarkable? This shows you how both bacteria and virus have evolved with us for many years. So clearly, our microbiome is a virulence determinant for bacteria. This is really an underappreciated aspect of viral pathogenesis. Uh, and human biology in general, everyone is looking at the microbiome in isolation. But in fact, it interacts with our virome, and it also interacts with our genome. You know, people are sequencing genomes left and right, right? If you go up to the medical center, it's a big deal that there's personalized medicine. We're going to sequence your genome and design treatments just for you. Well, guess what? This is bull because if you don't consider the microbiome, you're never going to be able to tailor anything because the microbiome is interacting with our genome. So unless you do the two together, it's not really a good thing. However, every hospital in the country is doing personalized medicine. So if you don't, you're going to be left out, and that means you're not going to get money, and that's what drives everything. So in the next 10 years, people may appreciate that we have to look at the genome, the microbiome, and the virome all together. That's not easy to do, but this is an example of why it's important. Next question. Which statement about determinants of virulence is incorrect? Virulence genes can encode viral proteins. Virulence genes can encode cellular proteins. They are the same in all viruses. They can be found in untranslated regions. They may encode immune modulators. Which one is wrong? Okay, wrong is they are the same in all viruses. They are not, obviously. They are quite different. Everything else is correct. Virulence genes can be viral or cellular. They can be untranslated, which shows you an example of that. And they can encode immune modulators. All right, so we've talked about a little bit about vir viral and cellular virulence genes. We've talked about non-coding and coding. We've talked a little bit about how viruses kill cells. But it turns out that when you get an infection with a virus and the, the way you feel, the, how you feel badly in the beginning, and even a lot of the pathology of a virus infection is because of your immune response. The immune response is a two-edged sword. It clears infections, but it also causes damage. And this is called immunopathology, or too much of a good thing. So fever, tissue damage, aches, pains, nausea. Next time you get flu and you have flu-like symptoms, you know, fever, malaise, nausea, lack of appetite, and so forth, 
as I've told you before, that's all due to your interferon response. A virus isn't making you nauseous. It's not anywhere near your gastrointestinal tract. It's up in your lungs. It's sending out cytokines. The cells are sending out cytokines which have an effect on your gut cells. Now, there are, in general, two different kinds of viruses in terms of cell killing. There are viruses that kill cells, and we've called these cytopathic viruses. They cause CPE. And there are also non-cytopathic viruses. We haven't really looked at many of these so far, but there are many viruses that replicate in cells, but they don't kill them. So how do they cause disease in you if they're not killing cells? Well, the answer is it's the immune response that's causing all the disease. For many viruses, the entire spectrum of injury, symptoms, tissue injury, and so forth is all immunopathological. So you have to remember this. This is a really important concept that immunopathology plays a big role in the outcomes of virus infection. So here are some examples. And immunopathology is very specific. It typically involves very discrete components of the immune response. And remember last time we talked about CD8 and CD4 positive T cells uh, and the two classes of CD4 positive, Th1 and Th2 helper cells, which make cytokines that do different things. Talked about antibodies made by B cells. Well, there are different examples of immunopathologies based on each of these individual types of immune cells. And there are just a couple of examples shown here. CD8 T cell mediated, Coxsackie virus is HIV, hepatitis B virus. All good experimental evidence that the immune response is causing the majority of tissue damage in these infections. CD4 positive mediated Th1 measles, herpes simplex, uh, Th2 respiratory syncytial virus, and here is a big one, B cell mediated for dengue virus antibody. So a lot of the symptoms of dengue virus infection, especially second infection, seem to be caused by the antibody. So let's look at a couple of examples of these, and so you know how we know this, that this is, a, is true and, and what happens. So here is a disease of mice. It's caused by LCMV, the virus I introduced before, where depending on where you put the virus makes a big deal for lethality. So here we're infecting a mouse with uh, LCMV, uh, and within uh, eight days, it's dead because we're putting the virus right in the brain. Remember, you can put, put one PFU in the brain and the mice will die. Now, if you do the same experiment and you immune suppress the mouse, it lives. It lives even with the virus replicating in it. So that tells you that the immune response is what's killing it. And then if you take that same mouse, which now has a persistent infection, the virus is replicating in it quite freely, making lots of virus, but the mouse is healthy because it hasn't made an immune response. If you then give that mouse T cells, the mouse will die. So that's what's happened here. Adoptive immunization is when we give preformed cells, B cells or T cells of, of specific types to the animal. Here we're giving T cells to this animal and it shows that the T cells are responsible for death in this animal. So what are the T cells doing? Turns out that they're CD8 positive T cells, which you know are cytotoxic T cells. So you could do the previous experiment with the different cell types. You can purify CD8, you can purify CD4, TH1 or 2, et cetera, and put them all in the mice. And it's the CD8s that kill them. And the reason is that they're killing the CD8 cells. They're trying to clear infected cells. Remember, these cytotoxic T lymphocytes recognize an infected cell by virtue of a viral peptide being presented on the surface in an MHC molecule, and the CD8 recognizes it and is killing the cell, but that is causing death in this animal. So here we have an experiment where we're some, some details about this. On the upper left, we have these LCMV infected mice. These are just uh, normal mice that are gonna die infected with LCMV. And we're comparing two different kinds of mice. One wild type, plus plus, that's green, and you can see uh, the percent alive is zero after 10 days. But if you knock out the gene encoding perforin from these mice, they all survive. Anybody remember what perforin is? No? Punches holes in cells. It's one of the things that the CTL releases that punches holes in cells. So you take away the ability to punch holes in cells and the mice live. That's immunopathology. Really clear explanation. Now, on the right is a measurement of liver enzymes which if you want to know if there's liver damage caused by a virus, if you don't want to take the liver out and you want the mice to live for a while, you can measure uh, enzymes that should normally be inside the liver cell. And if you find them in the blood, that means the liver cells are being damaged. 
So that's what this is, liver enzyme. We can measure those in the serum. And you can see wild type mice uh, infected, lots of um, liver enzymes coming out into the blood. Take away perforin, no more liver enzymes. And finally on the bottom is another uh, example of this. These are actually a different experiment where um, mice are infected with a different virus, Coxsackie virus, which causes an infection of the heart. When people need a heart transplant, it's often because they have had a long-term infection with Coxsackie viruses and we didn't know it. By the time you know it, the heart's destroyed. Turns out that that destruction is immunopathological. On the left is a section of heart in a mouse infected with Coxsackie virus. It's stained with a dye that stains damaged heart tissue. You can see all this uh, blue staining is damaged heart tissue. If you infect a mouse that lacks the perforin gene, that's what you see on the section on the right. You've gotten rid of all the tissue damage. So these mice no longer die of heart disease because you've taken out perforin. So this suggests to us if we could detect infection early in these individuals, uh, one way to prevent heart damage might be to inhibit uh, these enzymes. All right, so that's an example of CD8. There are also examples of immunopathologies associated with CD4 positive T cells. Now remember, what CD4 cells do, whether it be Th1 or Th2, they make cytokines, right? And the cytokines can either help B cells to mature into plasma cells to make antibody, or they can have, help CTLs to mature. So they make lots of cytokines. They can recruit many cells to an infected area. Uh, and some of the cells they do recruit as a consequence of making cytokines are neutrophils and mononuclear cells, which can cause tissue damage in themselves. And uh, you get immunopathology as a consequence of this, which is caused by proteases, radicals like nitric oxide, uh, and also cytokines like TNF-alpha. So in other words, the Th4 cells recruit other immune cells. Those immune cells secrete a variety of things that damage the cell. So let's look at an example of that. Uh, it is a disease called herpes stromal keratitis, one of the most common causes of blindness in the world. This is almost entirely immunopathological and involves CD4 positive Th1 cells. And what happens when you get this, uh, the virus is infecting your eye. It's actually infecting the outer layer of the cornea. There's a thin layer of epithelial cells on your cornea. The virus, the herpes virus is infecting it. And if you have multiple infections, it causes opacity in your cornea and you can't see any longer. This is stromal keratitis, it's blindness. So, and again, this is a, a picture of that where you can see uh, the uh, cornea is nearly completely white and so you can't see any longer. What happens is that uh, the virus replicates in the corneal epithelium. Now on the left is a section of cornea. On the bottom, the white area is cornea. And the top is the thin layer of epithelium on top of the corneum, just a few cells thick. But that's where the virus is replicating. The damage, however, happens in the underlying uninfected cells. These cells of the cornea are called stromal cells. And the infected epithelial cells secrete cytokines their job, of course, is to recruit cells into the area to try and clear the infection, but the cytokines damage the stromal cells below them. So there's no virus in the cornea, but it's simply the cytokines produced by CD4 positive Th1 cells that are getting into the stroma and damaging the cells, and that's why you get blindness. So it's not the virus, it's us. That's why I said last time, it can be your worst nightmare, your immune response, and here it's causing you uh, to be blind. One more example of uh, immunopathology, and this is West Nile virus infection. This is a flavivirus uh, that uh, is spread by mosquitoes and causes a febrile, uh, joint achy type disease, very much like Zika. But in a small percentage of individuals, the virus gets into the brain and causes encephalitis and infection of the brain. And th these people uh, usually recover, but they have long-term sequelae. They have uh, cognitive and motor issues for many, many years afterwards. So we really would like to know what's going on and figure out ways to prevent this. Uh, it turns out that in a mouse model for West Nile encephalitis, it is a toll-like receptor that is responsible for letting the virus get into the brain. So toll-like receptor, remember, is uh, one of the sensors of virus infection. It senses viral nucleic acids. Um, and if you make mice that lack the gene, they don't, get, they don't get West Nile CNS infections. Um, so the, the bottom line is that, and, and the reason why they don't get CNS infections is because the blood-brain barrier has not been altered. When you have TLR present, 
TLR senses the presence of virus, produces cytokines. One of those cytokines is tumor necrosis factor alpha, and that compromises the blood-brain barrier sufficiently to let the virus in. So somewhere else in the body, West Nile virus is replicating. It's eliciting the production of tumor necrosis factor alpha, which would normally be killing infected cells. But that, of course, gets in your circulation. It gets into your brain. It permeabilizes the capillaries. And then the virus can get in as well. And this is an experiment uh, that shows that. Um, here's a wild-type mouse infected with West Nile virus. And what they have done is to inject not only virus into these mice, but a dye. Uh, to show you permeabilization of the blood-brain barrier. So these are the mouse brains that have been taken out day zero, day three, and day five. You see day zero, there's no infiltration of the dye. By day three, uh, the dye is in the brain because the blood-brain barrier has been permeabilized. But if you do the same experiment in TLR3 knockout mice, you see you delay and you reduce substantially the infiltration of dye into the brain. So the dye is a measure of permeability of the blood-brain barrier. And so taking out TLR3 uh, gets around that problem. Another example of immunopathology. Now, other things that viruses do are poxes and rashes on your skin. And we've talked a little bit about that. Uh, these are typically immunopathological reaction. Here's a child uh, with measles. And all those dots on the child are virus uh, interacting with immune cells. So measles, smallpox, varicella zoster, herpes virus, these all cause, cause rashes. And they're typically caused by Th1 cells, CD4 positive Th1 cells, and macrophages that are, are homing in on the infected foci on the skin. They produce cytokines. The cytokines increase the permeability of capillaries. You have then T cells moving into the area, and you get a swelling and a pox or a rash. So next time you see someone with this, just think that's the immune response in action. It's trying to clear the infection, but it's causing one of these typical symptoms of the rash. Here's an example of uh, immunopathology mediated by B cells. B cells, of course, produce antibody. And this is relevant now because uh, dengue and Zika are both flaviviruses. And antibodies to one seem to cross-react with the other virus. So what I'm telling you now may have relevance to uh, Zika virus pathogenesis. Dengue virus is a mosquito-transmitted virus. There's the Flavivirus virus on the upper right. And it's mainly transmitted by Aedes aegypti, uh, which we can have this far north, not much farther north than uh, New York on the eastern seaboard, but certainly south of us and a bit to the central USA and, and Texas in the southwest. But of course, right now, these are dormant and they're not replicating. Um, this virus is endemic in many parts of the world, and billions of people are at risk for infection. So for example, Brazil, in the midst of a Zika outbreak, also has lots and lots of dengue, because Aedes aegypti is there, the virus is present, and it's spreading rapidly. There are about 400 million infections per year uh, globally, second to malaria among uh, insect-transmitted diseases. So on the top is a map that shows you uh, where dengue is mainly present endemically, where it's always circulating uh, in the world. The, the circles, the red circles, this is from a Google Health map. So these are current outbreaks of dengue globally. You can see many countries are experiencing outbreaks. Whenever you see a, a dot very far north, that's usually an imported case. Someone has been infected south of the equator and they're moving north because in these areas in the US, for example, we don't have endemic dengue. We have only imported cases so far. So you can see South America, uh, Central America, have, and the Caribbean have a lot of problems in parts of Asia as well. On the lower left, and this is, um, again, spread by Aedes aegypti, and this matches very well the range of Aedes aegypti mosquito. Now, this is a recently reemerged virus. Uh, shortly after World War II, all the disruption and, and so forth, the, tr the troop movement uh, ended up spreading dengue from Asian countries to, to much of the world. But then we started using DDT to get rid of mosquitoes. And in 1981, uh, this is a uh, map of laboratory confirmed dengue. This is before 1981 in South and Central America where there's a lot of dengue, as you can see on the upper map. There was no dengue because we got rid of the mosquitoes with DDT. Well, what happened? Well, we found out that DDT is bad, so we stopped using it. And the mosquitoes have moved back in, 1981 to 2003, so dengue is back. And it's been spreading like crazy ever since we stopped 
using DDT. Now, we stopped for good reasons. It's environmentally damaging, but now we have all this disease. And one of the ways that it spread after being eliminated, you know, the, the mosquitoes were gone. The 80s Egypti were gone in these countries. They came back through the tire trade because people uh, take old tires and they put them on container ships and they ship them across the ocean to different places and then they recycle them or reuse them for different things. And, you know, they're sitting like this on the ship or in, in storage areas and they have water in them. They have standing water. You can never get all the water out. Just think, you can dump it out. It would take you hours to do that, but once you put them back on the ground, as soon as it rains, they get filled in with water, and that's where these mosquitoes breed. Aedes aegypti like to breed in these small pools of water. So these have resulted in the introduction of mosquitoes to many parts of the world. As we'll see later, the Asian tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus, was introduced into the U.S. from tire trade into Houston. It was never here before. Now, anyway, that's why we have dengue in many parts of the world. What is this uh, infection, this disease? It is the primary infection with dengue uh, is a febrile illness, headache, back and limb pain, rash, aches and pains in the bones, very much like Zika, but a little more serious than Zika. Normally a self-limiting uh, infection, you recover in seven to 10 days and you're fine. But the problem is, uh, and, and here are the numbers, um, there's a self-limiting illness, you get better, but in one in 14,000 infections, you get what's called dengue hemorrhagic fever. Uh, this is when you have lysis of capillaries and extensive bleeding, loss of fluid, and this can be fatal, but it's one in 14,000. The problem is there are four serotypes of this virus, and the antibodies against one serotype do not neutralize infectivity of the other three. Remember, neutralizing antibodies, they bind to a virus and block infection, but also remember, that there were non-neutralizing antibodies that we talked about, which also can bind virus but don't block infection. So you get infected with uh, dengue type 1, and then let's say later you get infected with a different serotype, and that's when the problem begins. Uh, after the secondary infections, you get a much higher incidence of hemorrhagic fever and shock syndrome, 1, to 14, 1 in 14,000 to 1 in 50, 1 in 90. And the reason is, you have had your first infection. You now have memory, say, to type 1 dengue. You get infected with type 3. You have an immediate memory response, right? Remember, the memory is fast and, and solid antibody production. And you make antibodies to type 1 dengue. But you have type 3 in you. Those antibodies um, will bind. So that's the primary infection. Uh, you, you have a secondary infection. You now have antibodies from the primary infection, dengue one may, they will bind dengue three or whatever it is you have, but they won't block infection. They will bind the particle, but they don't block infection. What they do do, however, is allow uh, the virus to bind to cells like macrophages that they wouldn't normally infect. Because macrophages have FC receptors. FC portion of the antibody is that part down at the bottom, uh, below the two Y, the two arms, if you will. That FC can bind receptors on macrophages and monocytes, and they can let dengue get into those cells. Normally, they wouldn't get in there because there are no receptors for the virus. So you have a lot of virus production as a consequence, and these cells are full of cytokines and chemokines, and we think that is what causes the shock syndrome, the permeability of your capillaries, the loss of fluid, uh, and the death. So getting a second infection with dengue is really bad, and it's a B-cell-mediated disease. It's an antibody-mediated immunopathology. Now, there, there's only one serotype of Zika virus. So among Zika viruses, this is not an issue. But if Zika and dengue cross-react, it's possible that if you have, have already been infected with dengue, maybe Zika is worse. And maybe in people who, have, uh, who are pregnant and have uh, congenital birth defects, maybe it's because they had a primary dengue infection years before. These are issues that we, we don't know the answers to, but which are worth considering. So microcephaly may be in part immune enhancement disease, just like dengue is. All right, so that, those are some examples of uh, immunopathology uh, in virus infections. And again, most of the disease being caused uh, by your immune response. Viruses can also uh, do other things in terms of pathogenesis, and one of them is immunosuppression. Uh, this is when we have a global reduction of the immune response associated uh, with a virus infection. It can happen because the virus replicates in an immune cell and destroys it, so that's not part of the immune response anymore. Uh, it can mess up cytokine production and signaling. 
Uh, and uh, viruses, as I said earlier, they make proteins that antagonize the immune response, virokines and viroceptors, and they can, all of this can cause immunosuppression. So not only is the virus replicating in you, and maybe the immune response is causing disease, but the replication results in immunosuppression, which means you're susceptible to other infections, viral, bacterial, fungal, as well. So let's look at an example of this in um, a child with measles. So measles is one of the viruses well known to cause immunosuppression. So there's our child with measles. And um, what we're looking at here is the reaction of, of the child to a tuberculin skin test. So if you'd like to know that if you have ever been infected with tuberculosis before, which is a bacterium, of course, you can uh, put in the upper layers of the skin a little bit of tuberculin antigen, and you get a T cell reaction and a swelling. And if you do, it means that you've been previously infected. It's a nice tool to figure out if people have had TB. So what we're doing is taking a child at different stages of measles and doing a tuberculin skin test. So you can see at baseline, this is before the child had measles, you have a good skin test. This is called induration. That's how high the, the swelling raises on the skin in the TB test. When the child is in the midst of the rash, lots of virus replicating, there's no TB positivity. So if measles has completely suppressed the immune response, which would normally give you a TB test. So this child is clearly TB positive, but we wouldn't know it if you looked in the middle of measles. And then as the rash subsides, week two, three, and four after the rash is going away, then the TB positivity returns. So again, the point here is that the TB test is, is measuring an immune response to TB antigen, and that immune response is suppressed by having measles virus infection. How does this work? Uh, one of the mechanisms is shown on this slide. Uh, we think that the virus can, in fact, infect antigen-presenting cells. Now, antigen-presenting cells, of course, include dendritic cells and monocytes. These cells would normally be instructing uh, CD4-positive T helper cells in the lymph node. Remember, they're coming, they're, they're infected, they have viral proteins they're displaying, they're going to... Uh, CD4 positive T cells in the lymph node, and they would normally secrete uh, cytokines, including IL-12, to make a Th1 response. And a Th1 response, remember, you have cytokines that help mature CTLs. So these would be needed for killing virus-infected cells. Uh, what we think happens is measles virus infection of the antigen-presenting cells inhibits the production of IL-12. So instead of making a Th1 response, we make a Th2 response. And that means these Th cells are making cytokines that are helping B cells to mature, but that's not what you need to clear a measles virus infection. So you can't clear the measles infection, and you've eliminated cytotoxic T cells. So any other virus or bacterial infection that requires CTLs for regulation or clearance, you're going to get infected with that because those, those cells are not available. So the virus is biasing from a Th1 to a Th2 response by infecting uh, these antigen-presenting cells. So here are some examples of immunosuppression. We've talked about measles, which I told you infects monocytes and dendritic cells. It also infects thymic epithelial cells, and we think that's, that plays a role in immunosuppression as well. Rubella virus is also an immunosuppressive virus. And of course, HIV, which we will dedicate a lecture to later, is a big immunosuppressor. It infects uh, CD4 positive T cells. It, it destroys them. So you have no helper T cells to make cytokines, to make antibodies, and CTLs. And that's why HIV immunosuppresses. You get all sorts of opportunistic uh, viral, bacterial, and fungal infections. You get cancer as well, because your immune system cannot do cancer surveillance. All right, our question, which of the following is an example of B-cell-mediated immunopathology? CD8 T-cells that cause tissue damage, poxes and rashes, dengue shock syndrome, HIV-1-associated opportunistic infections, or all of the above. All right, most of you got C, 63% dengue shock syndrome is the B-cell-mediated damage. CD8 cells are not involved in CD8-positive T-cells are not involved in, uh, in antibody-mediated damage. Poxes and rashes are cytokine-based. 
And uh, up HIV associated infections are CD4 based, so it's just dengue. All right, so let's end up with talking about determinants that make you susceptible or resistant to certain virus infections. And the availability of genomics and the ability to sequence genomes has really revolutionized this field. These are all about host genes that determine susceptibility. And a really well-known one is a deletion in a gene called CCR5. It's a 32 base pair deletion in the gene that blocks the production of the protein. CCR5 encodes chemokine receptor 5, which is a co-receptor for HIV-1 virus. We talked about this a long time ago. Uh, if you have that mutation, you are not going to get infected with HIV-1. It's present, this mutation is present in a certain percentage of people of European descent. We don't know why it's been fixed in the population. There must be a reason. There may be some other reason why it's been selected for. We don't know what it is. But now it confers uh, resistance to HIV. And because of this discovery, people are trying to do therapy of various kinds where they give people stem cells, again, all the hematopoietic precursor cells in your bone marrow that lack CCR5 gene. And then you would regenerate your immune system and be resistant to HIV. So the famous German AIDS patient, the Berlin patient, uh, he, he had AIDS and he also had a cancer. So it was decided to give him a bone marrow transplant. And his doctor thought, I'm going to give him a transplant from a CCR5 mutant donor. So he found one, and this fellow got a transplant, and now he's free of cancer and he's free of AIDS. So more virus in him because all his cells are CCR5 negative, and they can't replicate in him. Unfortunately, this hasn't worked since then in any other people. Bone marrow transplants are tricky to begin with, but the idea is if we can somehow cut out people's uh, CCR5 genes, could make them resistant uh, to HIV-1. So we could use CRISPR. We could take out some of your bone marrow, culture it, knock out CCR5 and put them back in you, and uh, that would make you resistant to HIV. Another interesting gene that determines susceptibility is one that controls whether herpes virus goes into your brain. So herpes virus infections, as we'll see in a few lectures, uh, you get primary infections at mucosal surfaces, uh, and then the virus goes into your peripheral ganglia where it's latent. Periodically, it's reactivated, and you get a cold sore. But in a few people, the virus goes into the brain, and you get CNS infections. This happens in about 1 in 250,000 people. It has a high mortality rate, and it happens in people who get the primary herpes infection between 6 months and 3 years of age. And in older people, when, when herpes is reactivating, in a few people, it goes to the brain. So someone here at Rockefeller was interested in seeing if these individuals who develop herpes encephalitis have any particular mutations in their genome. So he sequenced all the innate immune genes of a collection of people who had recovered from herpes simplex encephalitis. So he did genome-wide association studies where you sequence the entire genome and then you look for associations with disease in the form of SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And he's found that mutations in these genes, encoding TLR3, UNC93B, TRIF, or TRAF, all predispose to herpes encephalitis. And remarkably, these genes are all in the TLR3 pathway. So TLR3 is an endosomal toll-like receptor that senses virus infection. It signals through TRIF and TRAF, which is not shown here, to make inflammatory cytokines. So mutations in TLR3, TRIF and TRAF, make the cell not able to properly detect herpes infection. UNC393B is a protein that's needed to get TLR3 uh, from the endoplasmic reticulum uh, to the endosome. So mutations there also dampen your innate response. Really nice example of how specific mutations in innate immune genes, and these things happen randomly in the population, right? We all sustain mutations, and some of them are deleterious, like this one. There are other determinants of susceptibility that are less well studied. So the kind of study I just told you about, the genome-wide association and SNPs associated with viral susceptibility, there are a few examples of that with different viruses. But for the most part, as of now, we still don't understand lots of susceptibility determinants. One of them is age. Very young people and very old people tend to be uh, more susceptible to infectious diseases than the rest of the, than the, rest of the people in, in between ages. We think young people, you know, when you're very young, you don't have a matured immune response. You know, when you're born, you have almost no immune response at all, and as you go through your first year or two of life, it matures. 
So if you get infected very early on, uh, you have freedom from immunopathology, but you can also get a serious virus infection. And this is modeled in uh, infection of mice with LCMV. And again, this is a virus we've talked about twice today. If you put it intracerebrally uh, into adult mice, it's lethal, but in infant mice, uh, they survive. And that's because for this virus, it's the T cells that are causing uh, disease. So if you are very young, you can be free of immunopathology in certain cases. But for the most part, uh, young, young kids develop a serious disease when the virus itself is causing most of the disease. Now, older people, why are they more sensitive? It's, it's a classic situation that people over 60 are more susceptible to serious influenza. We think, you know, their respiratory muscles, the respiratory tract becomes uh, less able to function, less elastic alveoli, uh, diminished cough reflex, and so forth. But there probably are more specific determinants that we simply uh, haven't figured out yet. And that age dependence of influenza is shown here. This is a curve of the death rate from influenza in different age groups. These are data accumulated over many years. And you can see there's a very high death rate uh, be, uh, on kids less than five years of age. Uh, and again, we think that their, mature, their immune response is immature, and so it, they can't control virus replication. If flu were a largely immunopathological disease, they would be spared disease, but it's not, and so they're, they're getting very sick and they're dying. And from five to about 60 years of age, the death rate from flu is quite low and then it goes up substantially over 60 years of age. So this is why we tell people over 60, you need to get your flu shots every year because this virus can be quite lethal in you. And every year in the US, there are anywhere from 5,000 to 30,000 death deaths as a consequence of flu infection. And they are largely in the very old uh, and the very young populations. Again, we don't really understand what's going on here. People have made mouse models to study this. I mean, the, the downside is a mouse only lives for about two years. So, you know, very young mice, you have a compressed window, and a very old mice, mouse, you have a compressed window of opportunity of what, as well. But there do seem to be mouse strains that show extreme susceptibility at either uh, end of the age spectrum. So maybe that will bear some fruit in understanding what's going on. Some other miscellaneous determinants, again, we don't know how they're working. Uh, men are more susceptible to viral infections than women. Uh, pregnancy predisposes to very serious virus infections, particularly for uh, the hepatitis viruses and influenza virus. Again, this is why we tell especially pregnant women to get immunized with uh, influenza vaccine. Uh, malnutrition also is a big determinant of susceptibility. Um, we think being malnourished makes you have a poor immune response. Uh, but we don't know exactly what's going on. But in many countries where there is extensive malnutrition, uh, virus infections are very severe. And measles is a great example of that. Now, we've eliminated measles from the U.S. for the most part because of vaccination. But in many countries of the world, we don't cover everyone sufficiently with the vaccine. So there's a lot of measles in, in parts of uh, Africa and Asia. And measles is 300 times more lethal in those countries because of malnutrition. And so uh, if we could, even if we can't immunize, if we could nourish these children properly, it might go a long way to uh, getting rid of this problem. Cigarette smoking is also uh, a, a big determinant of increased susceptibility to infection. And this, this of course makes sense. The smoking is damaged, not only damaging the mucosal layer, so you're stripping away that primary physical and chemical defense, but we also think that it's impinging on innate toll-like receptor-based defenses as well. And for similar reasons, air pollution is really bad for um, contracting respiratory disease. And of course, stress like that, which you get by taking an exam in this course, it will cause you to be increased susceptibility to virus infection. And stress in particular uh, reactivates some latent virus infections. As we will see in a few lectures, herpes virus infections, which typically are latent in you, are often reactivated. And that, by that I mean they're caused to uh, replicate, the viruses replicate again, in response to stress. And this is a well-studied phenomenon, although we don't know the cause. But I always say that, remember, stressed is desserts spelled backwards. So when you get stressed, just eat. 